that type of stuff uh, gives our company and gives our uh, work family um, purpose, and it gives it gives us a bit of a soul yeah. beyond you know dollars and cents and beyond right. growth and, and profit. And uh, we we really believe in the giver's gain. Welcome to Tap That AZ, the podcast that brings you the fascinating stories behind the exploding Arizona craft beer scene directly from the people who are making it happen. I'm your host, Eric Walters. In this episode, I sit down with Doug and Brad from Scottsdale Beer Company. These guys are doing some awesome stuff, giving back to the community, but also making some great beer and some awesome food. If you can't tell through this interview, I love their giant tots. Uh, So uh, when you go there, make sure you get those giant tots staff style. So uh, let's tap into Scottsdale Beer Company. Guys, we're here. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for this being is, here. Thanks. This is pretty awesome. So um, I've got some great beers lined up. We're going to talk about these things in a minute. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we're trying to get you drunk, obviously. I know. I know. <laughs> there was a, Is this a double IPA? Uh, it's eight percenter. Okay. Yeah. And then we got the barley wine like creeping That's over my shoulder here. I know. <laughs> points for you. <laughs> yeah. Save that for last. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so kind of take me back to the beginning. Like what, what, what's the story of the beginning of this place? Sure. Um, well, the, uh, the beginning of the brewery, the, really the genesis of the idea for Scottsdale Beer Company came out of our perceived need for better beer culture okay. in Arizona. Um, I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah. obviously we come from a place, my business partner, Tom, uh, who's not here with us right now, but Tom's from Seattle, gotcha. worked for Pyramid Brewing for 10 years, uh, with George Hancock, uh, you know, f- uh, Phoenix Sale and uh, George oh, Pass, gotcha. but yeah. was, a, was a real uh, strong mentor of ours. So we, uh, when we both came to Arizona in 2005, uh, we recognized that the culture uh, just hadn't caught up here yet, you know, compared to our home states of Colorado and uh, Washington, respectively. Right. So uh, when we were looking for places to go, like after rounds of golf and whatnot and after work, uh, you know, we ended up going to the same two or three places all the time. In Phoenix um, here? Yeah, in Phoenix. Okay. So we yeah. went to Four Peaks all the time. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, we would go to uh, to Whole Foods, and actually at the Whole Foods, we had a lot of our brewery planning meetings uh, at the uh, the bars inside, you know, the, the draft systems that were installed during our uh, planning phases in a lot of those, in a lot of those Whole Foods. Okay. Um, we would go to, the, you know, the typical craft beer bars and things like that. Uh, but it was always the same three or four spots that we would find ourselves frequenting. And so when the idea came, uh, you know, it was really a, a space here, uh, and there's really room here uh, for us to sort of appropriate that culture that, from our home states here in Arizona. Yeah. Um, we started to ask ourselves, what would that look like? Um, what, what would we want to build? And ultimately, it was, you know, we want to create something where guys like us would want to go. Right. And uh, so that we had more options. You know, we wanted to create an option for ourselves, essentially. Okay. And uh, th- that's how the idea began. And, uh, you know, here we are three years later at Scottsdale Beer Company. Yeah. <laughs> nice, man. And so um, I saw a sign. Was it the Odell sign? Yeah. Is that still in here? Yeah. That's that's odd, right? Well, it is <laughs> odd. And, and we have a unique relationship with Odell. Okay. Um, Brad, our head brewer, uh, to my right here. Brad, over is here. Is it your cousin? It's your, my sister's nephew. Your, his sister's nephew is the CFO at Odell. Okay. Um, oh, gotcha. One of my good uh, college friends, Smitty, is their uh, their marketing director. Gotcha. Uh, one of my good college friends, Kaylee Schumacher, runs the tap room. And Doug Odell has been here a handful of times and was sort of instrumental in helping us um, realize our vision and, and get to a place where we really believed we could do what we needed to do. Gave us some very sage advice on um, what he did and the type of organic growth that they underwent. And then on the other side of that coin... Odell uh, is unique in that, you know, they do a lot of the environment, uh, environmental initiatives that um, New Belgium and those other type of breweries do from, from, of course, from Fort Collins, but they don't talk about it. Okay. Uh, they yeah. don't market to it. Right. Um, all of the tap room revenue at Odell goes to charity. A lot of people don't know that. They don't really? talk about that either. Wow. Uh, you know, Impressive. tens of thousands of dollars a month um, that they that they give to local charities, um, but they don't necessarily use those as marketing points sometimes they'll talk about that after the fact okay so we found that real admirable so for us odell was sort of the model yeah um you know that was a a great um a great brewery for us to to look at and say you know how how can we uh, be more like odell because we thought they made great beer very slow organic growth Mm -hmm. they didn't leave the state until year seven they're still only in 14 states really uh yeah Uh, how Um, long they've been around uh 90 93 i think he started making beers and i mean originally good amount of time though like yeah yeah, a long time i mean compared you know to um 
and uh, we always compare and contrast to New Belgium because you know they're a half a mile apart, and those are sort of the two staples when I was at Colorado State. Right. Um, and just a different philosophy. Okay. Um, they were they were comfortable being what they were the entire time, and sort of let demand drive their growth instead of uh, focusing on the bottom line and really trying to to drive the growth of the company that way. Yeah. Um, nice. And they attracted good people. Okay. And yeah. we saw that right away. And, and in my opinion, they make some of the best beers around. The they way do. they use fruit is very subtle. Um, you know, it's it's, uh, it's very very conscious. Mm-hmm. All the beers that they make, yeah. um, very smart uh, in the way they make beer. And I mean, Doug started selling beers out of his garage on uh, two saw horses. You know, over a over a piece of plywood. Really? So yeah, That's really a really awesome story. And yeah. and even today is one of the most humble guys in the beer business. If you ever get to meet him. Yeah. So Brad and I got the uh, the honor of being part of the Beverage Business Institute at Colorado State University, which was a seed program for their fermentation science. Uh, college that they're trying to develop there yeah. at Colorado State. Okay. Odell and New Belgium are both big players in that program. So it's we like were, a degree program, right? Correct. Yeah. So we were part of the, the two-year pilot program to sort of see what that's going to look like. And when they were recreating the agenda and creating the curriculum for that program, we represented the, the small startup in that group. Yeah. So, I mean, we were in the, uh, we were in the room um, with Doug Odell, some, some big hitters uh, from beer, big guys from Coca-Cola. And, uh, and other, uh, um, other bottled beverage uh, business icons and had the pleasure of listening to those guys rattle back and forth for four hours about what the market's doing and where things are going. And yeah. so right from the get-go, uh, you know, Doug became a real mentor for us. And even, you know, to this day, they, they continue to take great care of us. Uh, and whenever we're back in Fort Collins, you know, we're, we're taking our team out there actually next month. Oh, nice. Uh, as a reward for some of our employees for the great job they've done. Some of our original employees, we still have eight of our original employees from almost three years ago. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so nice. we're all going out to Fort Collins and are going to go check out Odell and spend some time out there. So. Nice. You guys That's need a podcaster to cover the... <laughs> <laughs> Might need security. <laughs> but t- long answer to your question, we do have an Odell uh, Neon that yeah. hangs inside our brewery. You can't, actually can't see it unless you're inside the brewery looking out. Uh, it's right above one of the doors. It's, it's something that we just keep um, as sort of a... Uh, an icon for ourselves to remember where we started and yeah. and uh, what what the ultimate goal can be and uh, what we want that to look like as we grow. And, and that's a good combo. That's good inspiration because you, it it is that humble beginning, but it's also mm-hmm. success, right? Because you, you want to do that. You want to be successful at this, but do yeah. it the right way. Yeah, and yeah. the attitude. You know, Doug. Mm-hmm. If we went up to Doug after uh, after the first uh, conference at the BBI and um, said, hey, you know, do you mind if we take a photo with you? Just want to meet you. I've been drinking your beers for 15 years. And uh, he was like, me? You, know, right. you guys want to meet me? <laughs> right. I mean, just, you know, totally humble guy. Yeah. And um, they do some great stuff for their staff. You know, every three, if you're there for three years, you get to go on a trip. Uh, a couple of years ago, they went to Iceland with the crew. Oh, nice. Um, they, they'll go over to, to Belgium. You know, they go to Germany. And um, so they really, uh, they really uh, have a great relationship with their staff. Yeah. So that's something that we wanted to emulate. You know, yeah. and continue to strive to do that. Yeah, yeah. it's it's nice too. I love the place too. I, I think I read that it was described. You guys described it as agro industrial. Yeah, is that right? The design. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, is, so, what does that mean? Well, we had the pleasure of working with Kim Harris, who's okay. a local designer who's done a lot of iconic places that you probably know. She did the Crescent Ballroom and some other things okay. like that. Yeah. So we were really blessed to be able to work with Kim, but um, and and when you're working with a, a designer who's physically designing the building much like a chef you want someone who you have to pull the reins on rather than light a fire under uh-huh. and that was the case with Kim you know we, we we wanted a beautiful building we're in Scottsdale so we knew, we know that we needed to meet a certain aesthetic in order uh, to to jive with the Scottsdale vibe and with yeah. the Scottsdale community yep. but we also are a manufacturing facility so we needed utility out of the design mm-hmm. so if you come inside uh, the brewery you'll see a lot of repurposed sewer pipe like for example our chandelier when you come through the gate is oh, a yeah. okay. repurposed sewer pipe nice a lot of corrugated metal a lot of brick yeah uh, but then we try to create some organic fuel with our our butcher block tables and they were all tables, you know, custom yeah. made for us yeah. by our contractor um, a lot of uh, a lot of wood and a lot of mirrors concrete bar top um, and then you know little pops of color and things mm-hmm. like that so the aesthetic was uh, was planned definitely but yeah. we wanted to have uh, the term you use is agro industrial yeah um, so like an agricultural manufacturing facility so a lot like you'd see a production facility you know we have that feel okay um, yeah, I can but, see that, but yeah. we wanted to have uh, you know more of an some industrial materials that were used in the aesthetic so and yeah. then of course the breweries on display and that was important to yeah. us 
Uh, we got a, a beautiful system from DME, Diversified Metal Engineering, out of Prince Edward Island, Canada. Okay. Uh, brand new system that they custom built for us, so we wanted to show that off for sure. Yeah. We go to so many breweries in our tours where uh, it's all behind closed doors, and they sort of take you back there, and you can see the brewery, and it's awesome. Right. But we wanted people to be immersed in the experience, so no matter where you're sitting in the restaurant or at the bar, you could look to your left, look to your right, and sort of see the whole process take place around you. Yeah. And that's what we tried to achieve with the aesthetics. So. Yeah, and you even have like the, the hops and the barley and the water and the yeast definition like on the wall it's like uh -huh. artwork but it's it, it serves a purpose as well totally Education. it's educational yeah. Brent Donahoe who's a local uh, illustrator um, out of Tempe was uh, kind enough to uh, take care of all of our chalk work for us nice so he did uh, he did the uh, the brewing ingredients uh, boards that you see he did a bunch of little chalk work throughout the building as well as you as you wander around the building you can see his touch uh, in the, in the hallway. Right? Back bathroom, towards the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. towards the bathroom. Yep. And then here where we give Otter Pops away, okay. uh, which is especially pertinent in these hot summer months. Yeah. <laughs> and he did all the signage for that. Nice. Um, cool. And then we have, you know, brewing ingredients right out of the gate up front. You can see malts and hops. And uh, we love when our guests come in and are able to touch those and, and pulverize those hops in their hands and smell those oils. And the kids get in there and, what are these? So yeah. it's an opportunity for us to talk about the basics of beer, which is, you know, one thing that is important to us because we do get a lot of introductory kind of uh you know people that are new to the craft beer scene because right. we're a big restaurant right uh, we get a lot of people that we have the opportunity to provide some education for and be the first impression for craft beer yeah so it's important for us to make sure that they have a really good experience in, right. in a craft brewery it makes sense mm -hmm. yeah and, and brad how do you feel about like people watching over your shoulder as you work because oh, you get used to it <laughs> you do yeah <laughs> first it's kind of uh, strange yeah but uh, you definitely get used to it and yeah. uh People look at you at first, but then they begin to ignore you, and so right. you kind of can relax after a while. <laughs> then you want the attention back, right? A little bit. Like, oh, wait, please, sure. please look at me. <laughs> you can catch Brad rocking and rolling back there sometimes. He, he'll, he'll drop his guard, yeah. and, and we'll have some, some Pantera or Lamb of God rocking back there. <laughs> and you can't hear it inside the restaurant, but you'll see Brad. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, you'll see Brad rocking back there, and, uh, and that's why yeah, he's not having a seizure. He's back there right. rocking out. <laughs> that's awesome. Those are the moments where I forget everyone's watching. Me. Yeah, you're in the zone, man, right? And that's why you make such good oh, beer. Cool. Just zone in. Have you guys ever seen the, um, what are they, the headphone, like, discos? Where people all put on headphones and they're all dancing, but if you're watching them, you can't hear anything. Yeah, that's Brad back here <laughs> making his beer. <laughs> yes. So kind of re revert back because I did want to talk about this, and, and we, I, I, I kind of uh, didn't touch on it at the yeah. time, but pay it for or pour it for. Pour it forward. That's a hashtag you guys have it on the truck out there. I yeah, saw. Yeah, it's what? on the back of all our clothing. Yeah. What, all what our is that? So, um, you know, my business partners may um, not subscribe to the philosophy as. Uh, heavily as I do, okay. but a lot of times for me personally, uh, the brewery is uh, a charity in disguise. Hmm. So, uh, and again, we try to subscribe to that Odell philosophy where we don't talk about a lot of the charity that we do until after the fact. Okay. But uh, we work. We've uh, been able to donate about sixty thousand dollars back to the community in our our first two and a half years of being in business. Nice. Um, for us, we really don't advertise. Okay. Um, the way that we have tried to spread the word about SBC is to maximize our charitable relationships okay. with local charities mm -hmm. and um, use that earned media and uh, the momentum that we get from uh, those promotional events and those fundraising events to spread the word. Okay. So, um, for example, we just did a, uh, a fundraiser for Courtney's Place. I saw that, uh, yeah. Near and dear to my heart, Courtney's mm -hmm. Place is a, um, an organization just on Scottsdale and Shea right in our backyard. Uh, and it's uh, life enrichment for special needs uh, citizens of Arizona. Okay. Everyone, uh, you know, seven years old to 70 years old, everything from, you know, s slight, uh, slight autism to severe disabilities, you know, people that need 24 okay. seven care. Yeah. Um, it is a state funded facility, but um, the state funds really don't provide what they need in order to operate the way they want to. So it's all private fundraising. Okay. So we were, uh, we had the pleasure of partnering up with Courtney's Place about two years ago. And uh, the beauty of, uh, of that is that um, we, get to, uh, we get to spend time at the facility, which is a totally humbling experience. Okay. And um, that's really enriched uh, the lives of our employees and, and me personally. Yeah. And uh, when we're able to do those types of events, and you know, we, we call it pouring it forward, um, it really creates uh, an energy among our staff where they all get involved. So for example, for that event, everyone volunteered that day. Oh, okay. Uh, so they gave up their income for the day. Yeah. Uh, we gave up our, our the restaurant's income for the day and truly did, you know, pour it forward for that event. And we're able to raise about 29000 bucks in wow. four hours. For four the, hours. Yeah. For that's the, amazing. For the charity. That's and awesome. that's about 10% uh, of their operating budget annually. 
wow. that we were able to generate in, in a four hour time period in one day That's yeah impressive. in one day yeah and um that type of stuff uh gives our company and gives our uh, work family um purpose and it gives it gives us a bit of a soul yeah. beyond you know dollars and cents and beyond right. growth and, and profit and uh we we really believe in the giver's gain you know mm-hmm. and uh, we think that uh, we we originally wanted to become a hub in our community mm-hmm. and wanted to become truly like a, a public house. Right. And so uh, the beauty is that if you come in here on any, any given week, chances are you're going to see some of the residents of Courtney's Place and their family in the restaurant eating. Oh, nice. So they've become family as well. Yeah. So that's one example of, of Pour It Forward. We also work, I used to work at the Humane Society and uh, still volunteer at the Humane Society when I can. Okay. Uh, so we do a Bark and Brew event every year where all the revenue from the day uh, and the special beer that we make will go directly to the Humane Society. Nice. Um, but we've been able to work with about 14 or 15 local charities and uh, pour it forward for them. Yeah. And uh, that's some, that's to me, that's central to our mission. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not real sexy to talk about. Um, and you'll find that, you know, Brad and myself and Tom, we're not big self promoters. Mm-hmm. I just got an Instagram account about three weeks ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I had to get a Facebook account so I could be an administrator for our business page, yeah. but I don't really use social media personally. Okay. I don't have a beard. Okay. Right. You don't, yeah, I don't have a beard and I'm no bald. Yeah. Brad's yeah. the only hair in the group. So we don't have that to talk about. Right. Um, but you know, bigger picture for me, you know, pour it forward, um, is, is a, is a standard for our business and for our corporate culture that we can constantly strive to get better at. Yeah. And I think if we focus on that and we focus on being a, a good community leaders, um, everything else sort of falls into place. You know, the yeah. service in the restaurant, we won awards for our service year over year. Mm-hmm. And that's because we attract people yeah. that are into the fact that we work with local charities. They're willing to give their time. So it creates this great synergy in right. our work family and in our restaurant. And I believe you can feel that when you come in, yeah. you know, come into the building. Yeah. And then our regulars want to get involved. So, oh, nice. you know, we have 15, 20, 30 regulars that regularly volunteer at all these events. And, hey, when's the next opportunity I can get involved? And if you're part of our email list, we'll send out a call to action, oh, a volunteer nice. call to action. And we turn people away all the time. Hey, we filled up our volunteer roster. That's awesome. Um, yeah, but we're going to you're turning people away. That you, but you, for that the volunteer to, opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll get you on the next one. Yeah. You know, we'll be happy to let you know. Come over for Bark and Brew. We need 15 volunteers for Bark and Brew or whatever right. the case may be. And then we try to direct some of their energies directly to the charities okay so yeah. hey you want to go help at Courtney's place you know you, do you want you want to get a little perspective in your life go over and volunteer at Courtney's place for a day they can yeah. use the help nice so uh, that's what pour it for pour it forward is for us yeah um, and that uh, you know having that as our as our hashtag and as uh, as our tagline on on uh, our merchandise and things like that it's just a slight reiteration to our staff and to our community about the real reason that we're here and the real reason that we show up and work hard every day. Yeah, yeah, and that that makes sense too because like it, the, the other things fall into place if you, in my opinion, if you're doing things for the right reason. Yep. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so pouring it forward, you obviously have to pour something. So that's where Brad, <laughs> that's where Brad comes in, right? The oh, yeah. the beer guy. And I read that it uh, part artist, part mad scientist. Would you? I, wrote, I that. wrote that. You wrote that? <laughs> I don't know if he, if, he would, if he would say that about himself. But. He was eyeballing I, me like, that's Well, you know, uh, <laughs> to make beer, it is obviously, I mean, definitely part art and part science. So yeah. um, that's true. Yeah. I have okay. to say. Right. <laughs> In what way? Like, how, how do you, like, for you personally, like your approach uh, to making beer? Because I know each person has their own style, their own approach. And um, you, well, you started me off with two beers that I didn't think that I would like. And they were both fantastic. So you're doing something crazy back there with Pantera blasting, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just uh, to answer your question, art and science, uh, real quickly, an example would be, you know, thinking of what you want your beer to taste like. Okay. That's kind of like uh, an art okay. where you're like a picture or a song, you know, what kind of chords yeah. what do you want it to sound like? Okay. What do you want it to taste like? What, what do you want to stand out in the flavor? Okay. What do you want to be back in the background? Yeah. So, uh, and then you have to execute it, and that's where the science part. Okay. And the hard work. That yeah. There's most people don't mention that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Is there a part of the process you prefer over the other? Like, the honestly, I I love the whole thing. I mean, okay. I'm dumb enough to like cleaning the parts and <laughs> scrubbing the floor. I think it's cool because yeah. it's all part of the process to make great beer. You got to have clean equipment, yeah. and uh, you got to pay attention to details. So, 
it has to be done. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. To make it work, you got to do the work. Right. Yeah. And I've always heard that from like really successful people is like, you got to love the process, right? You don't want to hate the process just to get to this end thing that you like. You got to love the whole, the whole part of it, you know, and, and it shows, it shows in your beer. So, so do you want to tell people what you, uh, what you gave me here? You started me off with? Sure. The first one is a Saison. Uh, it's called Mint Condition and uh, we made it with rosemary, thyme and actual mint. And uh, what I didn't realize before I brewed this beer was that rosemary and thyme are in the mint family. So, oh, really? So, I didn't know uh, that yeah, the, the chefs here, they helped me out with things like this. And okay. uh, we kind of talked about it. And then we sampled a bunch of uh, different ways to get those flavors in there. And okay. uh, we came up with this one eventually. Nice. And I, I usually don't like mint, um, but, but I love saisons. And I tried that. And it was because the mint's not real wasn't like I ate a peppermint, right? It was it was very faint, but it was it's fantastic. And then the other thing is, and I've said this on multiple episodes, I'm not a fan of, of the sours. I'll, I'll keep I keep trying them though, um, but I know they're big at this point. But most of them taste like stomach acid to me. You know, no offense to the guys that make the sours, but just my palate hasn't adjusted. Once again, though, this one this one was fantastic. Yeah, this was what was it? Cranberry and orange. Uh, it was strawberry and orange. That's right. Yeah. Strawberry and orange. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, it was good. So yeah, that one's actually made with the saison yeast as well. Okay. Um, the thing about the saison yeast, um, which I think is great, if you just pay attention to the history of beer, like history is telling you, you know what works really great with vegetables and fruits? Saison uh, yeast. So yeah. uh, they, there's hints in history about what makes great flavors and I try to pay attention to that as well yeah well you said you're kind of a traditionalist in a way right of uh, the way you make beers is that right uh yeah I mean I respect those um the traditional styles of beer yeah um I just think it's cool how each like for instance in Germany the towns have their own special beer that they make and so yeah like all the breweries will make kind of the same beer and they've been working on it for hundreds of years so you got to think they've come up with a pretty good flavor after all those years. <laughs> right, right. It's got lasting power, right? Exactly. Yeah. So th that's the part I respect, uh, the history of beer making. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you guys have recently won awards, right? Like uh, Strong Beer Fest? You won some awards at the over the last couple of years, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you don't like talking about it a lot, but I'm going to make you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we're not self-promoters. I know, no. That's great. That's why you got me here. I'm going to pull it out of you guys. Yeah. So, no, it's awesome. And I mean, I see well, I see trophies up there. That's a baseball bat, um, so I don't oh, know. We support that's... a lot of local sports teams. So we okay. have a hockey team, a curling team, uh, a softball team. Uh, we support um, women's disc golf team here in okay. Arizona. Yes. So that's that's part of Port and Ford for us is making sure that we are showing a lot of love to, uh, we focus on, um, you know, um, people and animals in need primarily, but okay. we try to find some space for those two. But we did win, uh, I'll, Brad, I'll answer for you. So you don't I was going to say, he's not escaping <laughs> this. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm holding it, yeah. <laughs> so actually our first, uh, the first time, uh, the first festival that we participated in as a brewery was Strong Beer in 2000 and, gosh, I would guess what it was, was it 15 or 16? 16. 16, okay. And um, won two medals at Strong Beer. Nice. Actually, in two different categories. So the Texas tea, one for specialty stout. We, yeah, we did a okay. peppermint peppermint version of Texas tea, a mint version of Texas tea. Okay. Uh, that won a medal. And then um, what was the second one for? Uh, it was the Quadzilla. Ah, Quadzilla. Sorry, Quadzilla. our Belgian okay. quad, yep. Yeah. And that one for the Belgian category. So, yeah. um, and for us, that was a, a great affirmation okay. that we were uh, maybe on the right path as mm -hmm. far as uh, the way that we were making beer and Brad's approach. First right. competition we entered, we entered two beers and two beers medaled. So we were pretty, pretty yeah. proud of that. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you guys just increased capacity, I saw, right? Yeah. Like the capacity of... of By 40%. 40%. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like a big number, but it's 50 to 70. <laughs> right. Oh, <okay. laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, we did. We uh, and we're at, we're adding another twenty barrel fermenter um, in the next few months here, next four or five months. Okay. Um, we um, that will allow us to dedicate some of our smaller fermentation vessels to lagering. Okay. And uh, uh, to yeah. a dedicated sour you know program, mm -hmm. and uh, that's something that we've been wanting to do. But we do have a two hundred and twenty seat restaurant, and um, you know we're a busy place. Yeah. Uh, if you come in here on a Friday or Saturday night, even now in June, um, you know last night we were on a 45-minute wait for about two hours. Really? Wow. So nice. uh, we rock and roll here. Uh, it's yeah. a testament to uh, to Brad's talents and to our chef's talents. Yeah. But we have to feed the restaurant, mm -hmm. um, and so we've we've created a, an interesting uh, challenge for ourselves because we wanna we wanna 
you know get creative and get crazy and, and you know Brad does that on our small system a lot yeah um, but we have to uh, appease the masses if you will you know in, yeah. in, the, in the operational side of the restaurant so we sell a lot of those base beers you know big mouth blonde uh, that's our five percent blonde ale and we yeah this we, one here yep we yep. pound that out uh, that's we call it our gateway beer so uh, if we have someone who comes in and asks for a Coors Light or a Bud Light uh, we say hey we're going to give you a sample of the blonde if you like it your first one's on us and uh, oh, hey nice. congratulations you're a craft beer drinker <laughs> that's awesome yeah it's, it's, yeah it's a good opportunity for us yeah um hefeweizens and our wheat beers the belgian wit that we have now um you know those are really popular beers they move really fast yeah and so we do have that challenge of of uh, keeping up with um the restaurant's demand for the more basic beers mm -hmm. which i think we make really well mm -hmm. um but the in increased fermentation capacity will allow us to venture outside that box a little bit yeah. and also allow us to get out on the street more. We have about 45 accounts now around town. Um, some great accounts. We're in Casino, Arizona, Talking Stick. I saw that, yeah. Uh, Whole Foods. We've been in JW Marriott, Kierland. Nice. Um, and, of course, then your, your um, low-hanging fruit, as I like to call the craft beer bars, who are hungry for local product. <laughs> right, yeah. It's an honor for us to be able to be in those places as yeah. well. Um, so that will allow us to have a little bit more penetration on the street and be a little more effective in our ability to supply those local partners when they when they ask for our beer. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know what, a thing that, that came up recently um, and just a conversation I was having with somebody was the the challenge of having beer distributed mm -hmm. but then also having that available at your tap room, right? Because yeah. I've seen breweries that I'm like, dude, I tell my buddy, you got to try this beer. He's like, I went to the brewery. They didn't have it. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, they had it at this place, mm -hmm. but they, you know, because they're putting it out, but then they run out in the tap room. So yeah. that's a, that's a tough balance, right? It, yeah. it is. Yeah. 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 It's definitely a challenge. Um, my past job was in supply chain. So okay. it's, it's, uh, something that I've done before is monitoring sales rates and predicting when we need to have the next beer ready, but it is definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm going to brag on Brad a little bit here. I don't want anyone to come recruit him, but I really believe that he's the smartest uh, brewer in the business. Um, and, you know, Tom, uh, with his 15 years of experience at Pyramid and Santan and mm -hmm. in Seattle would, would say the same thing. And, and what a gift it is to have a brewer that understands supply chain. Yeah. And um, right. understands, you know, it brings the business acumen to the table to uh, take some of that pressure off of us as, as operators. Yeah. Um, to be able to understand that and to respond to the real-time data. You know that we're able to feed them through our POS system, and we, you know, we react accordingly. And when we meet weekly, uh, we talk about, you know, what beers are we comfortable running out of for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, another answer to your question is that there's a lot of local craft beer bar operators that are really good at buying a keg and then wait until it's gone here and then putting it on there. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we yeah. hope that doesn't happen with like our fresh IPAs and yeah, things like yeah. that. But, you know, we've been out of Texas tea here, and all of a sudden we'll see, oh, Texas tea is on it at this, you know, particular place, and it's like, oh. Right. And they saved our they saved that keg and we were out of it. And I think that's great because yeah. you know we as as a buyer we do have some guest beers and you know we we understand that and, and do the same thing in some cases. Um, you know we hoard some of those great beers and wait till the timing's right to release them. But right. um, so that's another reason that maybe you encounter that sometimes where we have it out on the street you know and then it's gone here. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, either way, you get you're, you're making fantastic beer, man. Like I've only tried one of the six here. Two actually. That Texas tea was fantastic. I'm going to try the, what is it, the Hazy Train? That's our Hazy Train. That's our newest IPA. So when I first started these, it's a Northeast IPA? Kind right. Of? Yeah. 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 So why, why like, have have the Northeast always made the Hazy IPAs? Uh, I won't pretend to know the, the exact exact history <laughs> of that, but uh, there's uh, the most famous example of that would be Hetty Topper. Okay. I've heard and, lots uh, of, I've never had one, but I've heard it's yeah, fantastic. And yeah. So... A lot, there's a lot of famous beers right now. I'd say that's definitely the hottest trend going on right now. Yeah. Um, and every one I've tried is a little bit different. Yeah. But the general uh, philosophy behind that beer is you want a little bit softer water profile. Okay. You want the bitterness to be lower. Mm -hmm. You want those hops to be really bright and juicy and fruity. And that blends with the yeast that you use, which is generally some sort of English yeast, and you let it ferment a little bit higher temperature, okay. and that brings out the fruity flavors of the yeast, which blend really well with the fruity flavors of the American hops. Oh, gotcha. Okay, right. So, and that's so that's the. Is it considered an APA then, an American Pale Ale? Like what is? Uh, no, I, it's definitely an IPA. Okay, what is the but difference? But it's different than well, I would like maybe the West Coast IPA. Uh -huh. The difference would be okay. uh, in the water profile. Gotcha. On a West Coast IPA, uh, for instance, uh, Pliny. Yeah. That thing is really bitter. And so it is, they yeah. do that through um, adding hops, but also through the water. 
Okay. And so on a New England style IPA, you're not going to have the same water profile. So mm -hmm. even adding the exact same amount of hops, it's going to taste differently. Gotcha. It's going to be a, a lot smoother. Okay. Gotcha. This one's really good. And this is, um, it, it does have a little bit more of the, um, more of the IPA taste than, um, than I expected. And I like that though, mm -hmm. right? Because I've had ones that kind of taste like a mimosa. You know, like not like mimosas, but I'm like when I want to drink a mimosa, I want to drink juicy. A, uh, yeah, 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 like juicy, like fruity. Yeah. And this has got that, but it also you can also tell you're drinking an IPA, which I like that. That's I think that's a good balance. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, again, the way I like to approach it is there's these traditional styles IPA, and then you can tweak them a little bit, or you can tweak them a lot. Yeah. I, I usually tweak them somewhere in the middle or to the little side. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And that, and I'm going to try this barley wine too. I honestly think I've never had a barley wine before. I always hear good wow. things about it. Yeah, I know Sweet. these guys are both looking at it like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thrilled. I, right. Yeah, we, so get to, we get to have a first with you here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of caramel malts. Uh, it's high in alcohol, and uh, there's a lot of residual sweetness that's left over, so it's going to be sweet on the palate. Yeah. In this case, it's an American barley wine, so okay. it's a lot hoppier than an English barley wine. It is pretty hoppy, yeah. yeah. I like it, though. But it's still sweet, like a barley wine. Yeah. So it's kind of a balance. It's um, if you're old enough, you might remember some of the early IPAs kind of tasted like this, real malty and real sweet, and okay. also hoppy. Yeah. What were some of the early ones? Don't put me on the spot, will you? <laughs> right. uh, Killian's right. right. How, how, old, think, how old are your listeners? <laughs> well, from 20 to 60, I think. So uh. one that uh, just comes to mind real quick is uh, the Left Coast. Um, they're double IPA. Okay. It's been around a while. Gotcha. Uh, it always reminded me of a barley wine because it's so sweet and dark. Man, that's so good. 11% you said? That's that's sneaky. That is a, That can be a sneaky beer, yeah. Doug's shaking his head like, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, that one will sneak up. That'll help you lose the floor. <laughs> right, right. Um, what, what time is it? It's like 11.15, so I should probably... Uh, I'll drink the rest of this one, but after that. 11.15 yeah. a.m. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I was hoping they didn't. we didn't clarify that. But uh, So another big thing about this place, and this is what draws my wife into this place, is the food. Yeah. The food is unreal. Yeah. Like, my wife is usually like, uh, why don't we go here for a beer, and then I want to go to this place for mm -hmm. food. And I said, well, I've heard they've had really good food, so let's try this out. And she was blown away. Yeah. So you guys uh, got a chef, right? Yeah. Like a guy who... Well, we, we've had a lineage of incredible people. We, uh, you know, again, I think part of our bigger philosophy has attracted really good people, and mm -hmm. that uh, isn't lost on the kitchen. So, um, uh, Chef Kevin Binkley, local staple, um, and has become a friend of ours. Um, we've had three or four of his guys come through here, and they've moved on to bigger and better things. Uh, yeah. We've had a couple guys that uh, Justin Olson. Uh, was here for um, about a year and a half and is now running uh, Cafe Binks up in uh, Cape Creek. Oh, gotcha. Um, okay. But we still consult with those guys on a regular basis. We text all the time. <clears throat> we talk about recipes. They'll come in and help us out. Uh, <clears throat> Jason Dwight um, of Perception Foods. Okay. Uh, Jason is an incredible talent. Probably the, one of the most talented chefs uh, I've ever encountered. And I've been in the restaurant business for 20 years. Okay. Um, yeah. And locally, I mean, I worked at Barcelona with Danny Hendon and saw some incredible chefs there. Um, and was with OSI with Outback, you know, corporately. And some of the corporate chefs, you know, in their company are incredible. But Jason Dwight is, is such a talent, and he still does all of our meat work. Okay. Um, works with us, too. We make our own pork belly. We make our own bacon. We make sausage and andouille here. Nice. Um, yeah, we do. We smoke everything in-house, so we smoke yeah. our chicken wings. You know, we, um, yeah, so a lot of the meat work, you know, the cochinitas pork is roasted in banana leaves. Uh, and a lot of that is born of, of, of their talents. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jason um, is here once or twice a week and, and works with us still. And then um, the, the, our actual cooks, the guys that are the, you know, the boots on the ground. Right. Are incredibly talented guys. And, you know, we, we have, uh, we bring a philosophy of food to the table that I think is unique because, um, you know, food is the way that we commune with our physical environment. Mm-hmm. And beer is too. Yeah. Uh, and probably the most intimate way that we interact with the physical earth, um, outside of you know working with animals and people. Yeah. Food, food is a uh, is you know we directly ingest you know something that is uh, born of the earth. Yeah. And so we have that mentality in the kitchen that it's really important. So um, we make all our own sauces. You know we make all our own dressings. Um, again, we make our make our own bacon and things like that. And for that reason, I you know I think 
even if that's lost uh, on someone as far as you know the culinary sophistication of the program you f- you taste it and you feel it on the plate <laughs> yeah you feel you that do. love on the yeah. plate and and i'm sure your wife you know uh that's what she's talking about yep um and that makes us a very prep heavy kitchen mm-hmm. so you know our first guys are here at eight in the morning every day oh, um gotcha. getting going on on prep yep um and we bring in you know we have food orders that come in every day um, you know, we get fresh seafood every day. Oh wow! Uh, we use walleye in our fish and chips. I can see. I saw the walleye. Yeah, yeah. that's that's something very you don't few see places very often use walleye all the time, and it's not the Argentinian brown, uh, crappy stuff. You know, it's right. it's from the Great Lakes. <laughs> okay. Uh, nice. We're able to get it from a Canadian fishery that isn't restricted by the same seasonality that U.S. fisheries are. So oh, the same lake on the Canada side. Yeah. We pay a little bit more, uh, and it's an imported product. Yeah. Um, and so, those little types of decisions, um, when you add all those up, you know, if you have a 50 or 60 those little decisions when you're designing a menu if you lean towards the philosophy of food being the way that we commune with the earth then all of a sudden the sum of all those little decisions Mm -hmm. uh, is a great restaurant yeah and in turn we attract great people we get good cooks that come here because they want to learn yeah uh, because they're adding to their uh, portfolio they're adding to their skill set learning how to how to um, work the meat program with jason dwight and learning uh, some of the techniques that Justin and Alex Schreibokel um, of Cafe Binks have brought to the table for us. And uh, and that's a self-perpetuating thing. Yeah. Uh, and we are able to incorporate seasonality. We change our menu every three months. Oh, okay. We have eight or ten things that rotate on a daily basis. We have a rotating wing sauce. We have a rotating cookie skillet. Uh, we rotate uh, cheeses. We make fresh mozzarella in-house. Wow. Um, so all those things that we're able to do. Um, you know, the, the sum of all those parts and all those decisions uh, is a great restaurant. Yeah. And uh, we, we felt like we wanted to have the same approach to food that we do beer. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, same importance and give, this, give the same energy and the same amount of uh, resources to both. Yeah. And so that's our logo. You know, it's a, it's a meat cleaver and a mash paddle. I saw that, so it's, yeah. It's, uh, where, where pint and plate collide, I think it says on our website. Yeah. And, like and that's that. the idea. Yeah. Great, great food it deserves great beer, and great beer deserves great food. Yeah. And the major complaint we got um, when we were forming the idea of SBC was, like you said, we go one place to drink and we go another place to eat. Yeah. And I thought that was a travesty. You should yeah. be able to get both of those things in one spot. Yep. And as a brew pub, uh, we knew that if uh, we're going to open a kitchen, uh, that's the way we wanted to do it. Right. And Tom and I were lucky enough to have restaurant experience because a good, uh, you know, a restaurant is a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, running a restaurant is uh, it's thin margins. It's a tough business. You know, Tom and I are lucky enough to have worked for some great operators. So we brought all that experience to the table um, because, uh, you know, a restaurant can sink a perfectly good brewery. I mean, I've seen mm-hmm. it happen in other states. And, and Meaning uh, like the, just what what's, has to be put into the restaurant part. Absolutely. And, the, and you actually yeah. see a lot of breweries now trying to open restaurants. Yeah. Uh, they want that retail space to get retail rates for their beer. Yeah. Because, you know, wholesale is a, is a tough model, too. You know, okay. production brew is a tough model, too. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've uh, w- without talking about specific businesses, I know there's there's breweries that have brought in restaurant operation companies to run their run their business because they just found it too much of a challenge. Mm-hmm. It detracts from the energy that they're able to put into the beer program. Uh, uh, you know, but Tom and I and Brad, we work it. I mean, we all work 60, 70 hour weeks. If you come here, you're going to see Tom or me. If you know, if we're open, you'll see one of us here, one yeah. of the two bald guys. Okay. <laughs> I sweep the parking lot every morning. I mean, we're totally connected with the business. That's awesome. And uh, yeah. I think that you feel that, you know, like we talked about when you come in and, and, and even just something simple like the fried pickles. Yeah. We get those uh, cucumbers locally, obviously when we can, seasonal, uh, seasonal restrictions, but uh, we brine them in-house. Okay. Um, we use tapioca starch, you know, as, as the breading on that. Um, nice light starch. We make the cucumber ranch that come with those fried pickles. Ooh, and that ranch is fantastic. Too. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the only thing in our freezer is uh, is some uh, proteins and hops. Okay. We don't have a microwave. No Chef Mike. Yeah, <laughs> Chef Mike. Yeah, no I've Chef never Mike. Heard that before. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know that's um, that's the only way that we're yeah. comfortable doing it. So. Our dirty little secret is that we're an awesome restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, we'd need to live in the brewery world. Yeah. We don't market as a restaurant. We don't mm-hmm. participate in a lot of the restaurant types of things. Like We've been asked to be part of a lot of festivals. We just okay. don't have the capacity yeah. to go do the taco festival with 3,000 servings or the mac and cheese festival oh, with yeah. 5,000 people over two days. Yeah. We just don't have the resources to do that. So right. we try to focus on uh, the people that are kind enough to walk walk through our door. And we know it's hard-earned money that they're spending here. We want to yeah. give them the best. So. Uh, we put our heart and soul, you know, into the food program, and I think that, uh, I think it shows. Like your wife, uh, like your wife says, uh, yeah, she, it certainly shows. She's a true testament to the, yeah, to that, yeah, tater tots. Those tater tots are amazing. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> labor intensive, man. Are they really? Oh, so oh. we have a we have a great prep guy named John Martin. Okay. And John spends three hours every day 
just three make, hours a day. Just making tots. Ah, uh, well, he's going to have to spend three and a half because I'm about to eat a shitload <laughs> of those. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> little, so little tip, uh, sometimes for family meal, we do family meal a lot here where, okay. you know, we feed everybody before shift or after shift. Yeah. And we'll take, uh, we'll take uh, a couple dozen tots and mash them up and uh, chop some bacon up on top and smother them with beer cheese oh, and uh, a little jalapeno man. crema. And uh, the staff will go wild on that. It looks. Are like, you saying uh, I should suggest that when I? You order. can do it. You can, we'll do it for you. <laughs> what, what's the style? What should I? How should I order it? Just staff the, style. Staff style. Yeah, okay. Staff nice, style. Nice. We'll know what you're talking yeah. about. But it's <laughs> awesome. like a shark. It's like a shark and a whale carcass. You know, uh, when, when the staff uh, is turned loose on a tray of right. tots. Yes. Staff style. Yeah. Those things are they're so good, and I didn't realize it. So is that is that like one of the top things? Like do uh, people, pickles and tots are our number one pickles. selling appetizer. Okay. Yeah. You know and. Side note, we also try to create a lot of value with our food menu. Yeah. Um, we are able to have thinner margins in the restaurant side of it because we are a brewery, so we enjoy the margins of, of uh, you know, our retail beer sales. Um, so, you know, I mean, tots and pickles are, are on happy hour, four yeah. bucks, you know. Right. So yeah. a great deal. You can come in here, and from the start, we wanted to have someone with a $20 bill mm-hmm. to be able to come in here and get a couple appetizers and get a couple beers yeah. and be able to get out of here for 20 bucks. Right. Uh, and we've been able to, you know, to retain uh, that value, even though commodity prices are, sh- are shooting up. Uh, food prices are uh, reflective of inflation, so you're seeing your proteins get more expensive. Okay. Bison and walleye have gotten exponentially more expensive over the years. Yeah. And we've had to uh, adjust, you know, slightly as as far as menu pricing goes. Mm-hmm. But I think I think we're still uh, value wise one of the best restaurants in Scottsdale. Yeah. Especially because uh, everything is is made fresh, and and you know the beer you're drinking is usually eight or ten days old. So. Yeah. Well, and value too, right? I mean, it's just that like not, you're you're not spending a lot, but what you're getting for that is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, we've been known to order like three, four orders of the tots. That's the idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the idea. And you know, we yeah. do tacos on Mondays for two bucks. Oh, uh, okay. And yeah. we'll have people that you know, it's like oh, third round of tacos, table fifty-two. <laughs> that's their that's their fifth round of tacos. Yeah. Uh, but I love to see that. You know, yeah. we love to see people hang out and linger. I mean, that's to, to us, that's uh, proof positive that we're doing something right when people come in here and here for four hours and they they yeah. try six different things on the menu and they have a fifty-dollar check. You know, yeah, and that's as good as it gets. That's what we wanted as right. consumers, and that's what we wanted to build as operators. So. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's taking that right approach, like you said, going back to that organic growth, of like just doing the right things. You know, you're not trying to gouge people for like, oh, these tots are. No. They take three hours to make, so they're twenty nine dollars. Right. Know? Yeah. yeah. But, well, and we yeah. source locally too, as much as we can. You know, we use McLennan Produce and. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, we we uh, Jason Dwight is great at helping us source from local farms. Um, Shamrock is our broadliner, you know, so that's uh, a local company to yeah. some degree. Uh, we use Sweet Republic ice cream, Bohemian Roastery coffee out of Tempe. Oh, nice. So, um, and it is more expensive to be local. I mm-hmm. mean, no one, no one really talks about that, but it yeah. is more expensive. And ultimately, the consumer is the one that pays for the increased expense of being local. Right. But we've been able to develop some good partnerships with our with our uh, local farms. And Sweet Republic, for example, we give them beer. Mm-hmm. They make ice cream with our Texas tea. Oh, they really? They sell that retail out of their shop. And in turn, they give us uh, ice cream at a great rate. Really? So we're able to have some reciprocity with some of our local companies. Same with uh, Bohemian Roastery. We buy their coffee, but they'll do special roasts for us where Brad can use, you know, use in a beer. Yeah. A proprietary roast, you know, that we can use uh, in our beer creation. So we've been able to create some really good synergy with some of our local companies. All of our spent grain goes to Arizona Beer Beef. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cody at Arizona Beer Beef is an awesome guy. And uh, he, in turn, you know, sells us our grass-fed uh, burger patties mm-hmm. um, at a great rate. So we leverage, um, you know, our ability to work with those local vendors to make sure we keep costs down and create that value and sustain right. that value for our guests. Yeah. yeah, nice man. Well, you guys are doing the right things. I, I, I love you, this brother. place. And and if you guys are listening, whoever's listening to this, you got to come here because this is all the beer is great. I'm gonna kill some tots and the what is it? Three triple cooked wings. Yeah. I don't even know what that means, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some of those for sure. Well, I'm, I'm wordy, but I'll tell you in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we start off by brining them. Okay. Um, so that is essentially a, you know, a method of cooking, um, but we brine in-house. So that's just like a soak, right? It's, like, a, it's a salt and sugar solution. Okay. Um, really the only way to get deep penetration uh, as far as the cooking of the wing goes. Yeah. Um, so we'll brine um, overnight brine our wings. I don't want to give too much away, right. uh, but we brine our wings for a certain amount of time. Uh, then we smoke them for a prescribed amount of time. Uh, then from the smoker, uh, they are going into the fryer. Okay. Um, from the fryer, they're sauced. Then they're grilled. Then they're sauced again. Then they're served. Wow. So they fall off the bone by the time you get them. So yeah. it's really quadruple cooked wings if you uh-huh. count the brine. Right. Um, but so the brine's not even one of the three. The brine's not one of the three. Uh, yeah, we yeah. got the smoker, the fryer, and the grill. Yeah. Uh, and we have people that want grilled only wings, and we do that too. That's no yeah. problem. You know, we have a very health conscious consumer base here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Right. And, 
Um, and that's great. So, you know, we, we uh, react when someone needs something special. But if you come in and order them how they are, they're uh, triple cooked, quote unquote, but they're actually quadruple cooked if you include the brine. So yeah. a lot of time. You know, IPA mustard, it takes us 12 days to make. Really? Our ham for the ham and cheese sandwich is yeah. a 10-day 10, a 10 brine. Really? Um, okay. So a lot of times. So we always are having to stay ahead of the game. Mm-hmm. Again, we're prep-heavy kitchen. Right. Yep. But like you said, you can taste it. You, you can You can taste that. It's not, you don't have Heinz just pouring it on the oh, plate, no. right? And our health <laughs> inspector eats here regularly. Okay. I love to see our health inspector comes in with her family and eats yeah. here on a regular basis. Nice. That's all a good our, sign. All of our vendors who are in our kitchen all the time, yeah. they get excited about what we're doing. You know, when anyone yeah. comes through the back door, even the UPS guy, I'm like, hey, man, do you want to taste this ham? <laughs> it just came out of the smoker. You know, it's 10-day <laughs> right. brine. Right. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. So we have a lot of fun. Yeah. doing what we do in the kitchen. I need to get a job at UPS. That way I can <laughs> try some of this stuff. <laughs> They're probably hiring. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, where can, uh, I know you just joined uh, Instagram, what you said, three days ago? A couple of weeks, three weeks ago. <laughs> right, right. But like, uh, but the, the company's been pretty prevalent on, on social media, yeah. right? So how do people follow you guys? Yeah, so we're uh, Scottsdale Beer Co. Okay. Uh, on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. Facebook, uh, Scottsdale Beer Company. And um, then our website is scottsdalebeercompany.com. Okay. Um, if you ever want information, it's info at Scottsdale Beer Company. Okay. We regret making that long handle. Sco Beer Co. or something would have been much right. more effective. <laughs> SBC. So, yeah, 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 tell yeah. the Scottsdale Beer Company, all spelled out. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay. We are Scottsdale Beer Company and scottsdalearizona.com, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then again, the hashtag, pour it forward. Yeah. Uh, that's right. applicable on all those uh, platforms and social okay. media. Yep. Nice. Yep. Nice. Guys. And, and we do a lot of, uh, we disseminate a lot of information on social media. So a great way to find out what's going on here. Okay. Great. And you, you were telling me earlier about um, uh, newsletter, right? You have a newsletter yeah, subscription we, uh, for like, can, on our website. You can yeah. opt into the email. Okay. Um, and uh, I personally send out all those emails. So we do beer release announcements. Okay. Um, usually a little bit prior to social media so the people yeah. that are kind enough to to uh, volunteer to get information from us we let yeah. them in on some of the small batch beers and stuff that we necessarily don't announce on social media because okay. they're gone so fast yeah uh, we create some disappointment when people come in 48 hours later it's like sorry it's already gone <laughs> right. uh, so right. we learned our lesson there but yeah yeah we do that we do the, the volunteer calls and things like that and then okay. um all of our uh, weekend food specials and things like that, those are all opt-in options as well. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. We only bug people that want to be bugged. Right. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Right. Yeah. Because you don't want to be overwhelmed with things like, what do I like? Let's no, and yeah. there's ad fatigue on social media platforms. If you read the, um, you know, if you look at the um, quarterly performance reports from Facebook and from Instagram, the engagement times on those ads is really diminishing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, Facebook uh, organic reach is down to like 6%. So one out of 14 posts that we put out is going to actually reach the people that have opted in to follow us. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, and those algorithms change all the time. Yeah. So social media is a great platform, but it is an, an evolving platform. Okay. So the best way to get information from us is definitely to opt in okay. to our to good old email, you know, right. the email system, um, which for us has been a, a probably the most effective ROI. Really? Um, interesting, yeah. Email's yeah. great. It's opt-in, so you have people that are wanting the information, and we're able to get that out, you know, real time. Uh, we use a company called Fishbowl that manages our email database, and so okay. Fishbowl's great. We can go in there and uh, create an email and send it out real time, and you get the information immediately on your phone. Yeah, nice. All right, guys, we'll opt in then because you don't want to miss the stuff that got tater tots, special release tater tots. I'm going to send right? you home with some tots. Right. <laughs> you can tell I like them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> guys, thanks for doing this. This has been awesome. You, if you guys are listening at home, you got to get here. Great beer, great food, awesome people. Thanks, thanks. man. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for listening to another episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it once again. And if you do, let's spread the word. Help me get Arizona beer on the map. Go to iTunes. Give me a rating review if you're feeling up to it. At least tell a friend. Let them know that um, you like the show and they might like it too. In the meantime, always remember, stay awesome.